I had sent off an article because of the pandemic that's going on, Latin American crime gangs, um, they adapt and they want to be seen as the, let's say the good guys in the community. And so they hand out um, food to the needy in a time of crisis. It's a great way to get people to join the gangs as well as to um, make sure that the gangs can operate well during this time. I did find it interesting as I went through the article uh, that the, um, the local authorities, including I believe it was the mayor of the town, had gone to the heads of the gang and um, expressed to them how to deal with uh, coronavirus and to prevent the spread. He's, he said, I need to acknowledge who really runs this city. Although our borders might be closed, in this case, they're often shipping, creating shipments of drugs by submarine. So I'm not necessarily sure that those same borders would apply. So to you guys, um, I just wanted to know if you have thought about how the flow of funds might change going forward with the pandemic. I feel as if uh, this is a way of gaining empathy for for the for the activities, and maybe also they are like uh, in a mode to recruit the local public into their upcoming activities. Maybe, I mean, we 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 cannot forget at any moment that they are uh, they are they are they are not the good guys, even if they are doing an act of goodness at this point. But in the end, they are not going to come to the mainstream. So, do, I mean, I will ask a question to everybody over here. Is this, is this a way or is, do you think this is a method to actually recruit people into your gang or gain an empathy from the government so that they are soft on the activities uh, that, that they will be doing henceforth? Or maybe this is one of the acts of actually trafficking, trafficking the drugs in the... Um, in the parcels, in the food food parcels, or something. Uh, I mean, these are the ways that that can actually lead up to these kind of consequences. Everyone's waiting for some very wise words. <laughs> Go for it, Amber. <laughs> I'm going to assume that that like when they're doing these things, there's there's part of it where they uh, often people that are part of those criminal organizations actually live in the community or part of the community. So I, I don't think that it's completely divorced, but I don't think they're, they're necessarily completely benevolent acts either. Um, I, well, when I look at things like this, I, I don't think that there's, you know, that pro quo, like we've done you a favor, ergo someday you will do us a favor. And maybe in some cases there is, I don't know. Um, I think there's certainly an expectation that the people in that community will remember that they were fed by that organization. And if at a later date, someone from that organization needed to hide out or pass through and law enforcement was to ask where they were, um, you would be less likely to inform on or talk to law enforcement um, about someone who had helped you previously or about an organization that had helped you previously, in particular in the absence of government aid. And, and I think that was one of the most striking pieces of the story. The people in those neighborhoods aren't receiving um, aid. They're, they're not having their basic survival needs met. And I think that if I was in a position where I couldn't feed my family, and the only alternative that I saw was to take food from a gang. Yeah. I would probably take the gang food and feed my kids. I, I, mean, I, I think that's a choice that I would make without questioning it. And so... It would be a natural choice. It, exactly. And, and so I think part of that, um, part of the piece that we have to think about is, is not just the AML perspective, but the human perspective. That, and how do we move away from these systems um, and, and deal with some of the systemic problems rather than just the, the fallout? Because when we're at AML, we're, we're already at the fallout. Yeah, that's so true. On you, I see you had your hand up and I'll wave hello because I haven't seen you in a while. So hi, <laughs> go for it. It's very critical for, for these gangs to have public support and public sympathy. And it's very, very effective and they don't have any they don't have any age restrictions on who they can recruit, so they use kids a lot. And my fear is that this could actually extend to other predicate offenses 
um, not just drug trafficking, we could extend to human trafficking. We could see really, really, really bad players um, try to use this opportunity to, to prey on our victims and try to curry favor. Very interesting. I see uh, Mohit, I'm not sure, I think you're connected by phone. I believe that's so why I don't see you, but uh, he wanted to contribute something. All right, so just, um, just to kind of talk about what uh, Amber and, and Monty both mentioned, uh, when it comes to uh, the way that the drug cartels and um, those organizations uh, deal with the public, one of, yet yeah, absolutely one of the ways they do it is by, you know, incurring the empathy, incurring the support through poverty, impoverished, uh, organi- organi- or impoverished uh, places. Uh, but what is kind of not understood is that they actually are the government that's there. Uh, one of the prime examples of that are the favelas in Brazil, where there is literally no government. It's just the crime organizations that run that area. Um, like Manju mentioned, you know, they don't have any restrictions on who can join and who doesn't join. But it's like that in a lot of areas that even aren't third world, like uh, there are French um, apartment complexes which are totally not run by the government and are basically managed by crime organizations. Uh, that's one of the big ways that they deal with the recruitment and uh, they get support from the public. And the other thing is, uh, the big piece of this is corruption. Um, corruption is one of the big ways that they kind of deal with this. So, you know, it's, we're kind of seeing out in the in the world now um, what all those uh, underlying things that Amber mentioned. You know, we're we're seeing all those kind of come to the light. And you know, it's even even to mention something that we talked about a couple weeks ago that's still released now. Uh, we talked with Tamea and Rochelle about um, how sex trafficking and human trafficking is working now. When one of the recruiting methods that they're using is uh, to get young girls to do camming, and how that's going to relate going forward too. So that to me, you know, to talk about what's going to happen going forward, it's a scary, scary proposition. Yeah, and you've got you've got the pieces being potentially exposed now by the economy taking a downturn but then you've also got um, these criminals potentially trying to ramp up for when the economy economy is back so what better time like you said mohit to recruit whether it's um, in the human trafficking or sexual trafficking girls going towards the cam and online um, or just recruiting new younger uh, people or kids into to gangs and getting that organization set up for uh, to thrive potentially later what, what the scary thing is, is right now, it seems like the criminal organizations, well, actually, I should just say, the criminal organizations in general, they're more uh, adaptable. They're, they're ready for change. Uh, that's kind of their business model. Whereas governments and regulators and us, we are, you know, behind and we don't really have that adaptability, that ability to change on the fly and really catch up with them and what they're doing. We kind of have that with regional grounds to suspect and I feel, and I feel like that's one of the big reasons why FinTrack is very um, lenient with our, um, you know, what is reasonable and what isn't. Because if you make it so that this, 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 this is reasonable, uh, you know, it, it, you might miss something that's there. So I, I feel like that's one of the reasons why they leave it so broad. I like that. You also looped question two into question one. Thank you. (laughs) But I wanted to open it up. What do you guys uh, see going on? Any changes recently? Or what what are you thinking is next? Or what's on your mind? What did you expect to discuss today? (laughs) Go for it, Holly. Hi, uh, this is Holly from Scotiabank. Uh, I just want uh, to ask the people who are working at FIU, or maybe you guys know, like with the current situation, do you expect... uh, you know, back to the FinTrack guidance, uh, submit STR, you know, as soon as uh, practical. Uh, practical. Um, do you see an increase in alerts? Because I know, uh, you know, the trading, definitely uh, volume trading increase. So alerts, uh, volume of alerts increase. How do you like, how do you see this web go and uh, foresee whether we have some challenges in, you know, about about STR on time? And also how do you, um, interpret that as soon as practical in your in your organization. Is there anyone on the FIU side that is brave enough to say whether or not their team is able to deal with either the onslaught or a lowercase letter? 
not sure that we might have that in the room today. I'm, I'm open. Raise your hand if you want. Oh, go for it, Kayla. <laughs> so full disclosure, I'm not in an FIU anymore, um, but I was an investigator for uh, four years and it's kind of where my heart is. Uh, so as of the new year, I'm now a business analyst. Um, but I think it depends on the institutions. It's on the um, different banks are also, at least Canadian financial institutions, um, are, have set things up really, really differently. Um, I worked at one big bank for a few years, and now I'm at another big bank, and the way those two institutions manage the triage and case processes are entirely different. And they're actually framed under very different SVPs. Um, so it's it really depends on how connected those units are, their tech, technological abilities, um, if they're international banks or more local national institutions. Um, I will say at both banks, so the time from alert to case to actual adjudication and when it comes to decision making, there's a big gap. Um, and the threshold for filing I found has gone uh, the threshold is getting less and less to file at this point um, and now with some banks coming into the file on every single transaction um, as well has had a really big impact on the amount of time it takes to complete an investigation and then even to file so banks are starting to have filing teams as well but even those reports need to go through approval processes so um, I think there's no, we haven't gotten to a happy medium yet to deal with the sort of real time constraints that we have, um, as well as the organizational constraints. Yeah, we, we've certainly seen that um, a few big banks uh, that I've worked with in the past, I would say, um, have perhaps struggled recently with trying to get all of their FIU working at the same time from home. So although some of the technology might have existed, getting everybody online either at the same time or distributed throughout the day um, has been the challenge for many. So um, I believe alerts certainly in, in some areas might go up more than they might go up in others. So Holly, you spoke to the trading, that would absolutely make sense. Um, uh, those might go up, others might not be, we might not see as many people rushing the bank machines at this point. So you might see um, changes in the, the level of cash and so perhaps fewer uh, cash um, uh, reports going out. But ultimately, I think it does come down to the technology and people being able to work those. I think many of the banks have taken it seriously. They're not looking at it as, okay, we can hold off the file, uh, but there would be definitely a prioritization given uh, that pushing the paper through um, is slower due to, due to techni technological connections. All right, folks, so I'm thinking for the next one. So we're going to do another two week gap and I'm thinking next time I'll um, I'll ask the audience for I'll give a bit more notice for the next one. Um, and once you're registered and all that, I'll be asking the audience for what questions you'd like to see asked. So have an excellent night, folks, and uh, I will miss you for the next two weeks. I'm going to try and see the sunshine in my backyard for a bit. So I hope you all stay healthy. <laughs> have a good one, folks. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.